Well, let me, uh, let me pray for us as we look at God's word. Lord, as we turn now to open your word and to gather around it in these moments that you've given us, May my words and all of our thoughts be pleasing and acceptable to you. And may your word come inhabit this space. The living word, the eternal word, Jesus Christ himself. That we may see him. That we may be changed. It's in his name that I do pray. Amen. Well, I'm getting some feedback from this monitor right there. Is there any way to cut that off? If so, that would be great. Um, So, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Those are the last words that Jesus said before leaving this earth. All authority... Therefore, go. Today is, uh, as we've noted, uh, we have a focus on uh, God's world mission. Uh, How is the church supposed to think about God's world mission? How are we supposed to think about ourselves in relationship to God's world mission? Well, in the book of Acts, Luke goes on to record how Jesus said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Who's the church? What is the church? Uh, What's the purpose and the role of the church? I think if there is one word that I would say encapsulate, best encapsulates the purpose and the role of the church, it is this word, witness. You are my witnesses. And and not just some churches, all churches. Not just some Christians, all Christians. Not just in Zambia and in Zimbabwe, but in Omaha and Ottawa. All Christians everywhere, in Jerusalem and in Judea, and even at the ends of the earth, you are my witnesses. And here we are at the ends of the earth. Do you know that? Uh, That wouldn't be a bad name for a church, the Presbyterian Church at the ends of the earth. Because that's who we are. Have you ever considered that you are... God's witnesses here in Santa Barbara. Have you ever considered the need? Uh, Barna is a um, statistical group that is based out of Ventura, California. And they do statistics on all kinds of things, particularly in North American culture and its relationship to the church and Christianity. In one of their articles, they ask the question, what are the least church cities in the U.S.? In that article, they distinguish between those who are de-churched and those who are never churched. The de-churched are those who have been, uh, had attended church before, but have never, haven't attended a church in the last six months. They're de-churched. They were in church and now they're not. And you can think about some of the places that would be like the highest population of de-churched folks in the, in the country, right? San Francisco, Seattle, New York. These are de-churched places, or you can think of the Northeast. But what if we were to ask the question, uh, what are the the most never-churched cities? By never-churched, they mean, um, they they define never-churched as those who have never regularly attended a church in their life. These are people who don't know who Jesus is, don't know what he did, don't know the claims of Christianity, don't have a basic understanding of a biblical framework and frame of reference, uh, they are completely clueless. They have never, ever, ever been to church in their life. And do you know what city ranks second on that list? Santa Barbara. 
You are my witnesses, Jesus says. Here in Santa Barbara. Here at the ends of the earth. The need, the need is great. And so is the challenge. And so is the challenge. The Welsh preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones, who held the pulpit at Westminster Chapel about a mile or less from Buckingham Palace, he noticed this challenge as early as 1959. He said, I see a very great difference between today and 200 years ago, or indeed even 100 years ago. The difficulty in those earlier times is that men and women were in a state of apathy. They were more or less asleep. There was no general denial of Christian truth. It was just that people did not trouble to practice it. All you had to do then in evangelism was to awaken them, to arouse them. The kind of problem facing us now is altogether deeper and more desperate. The very belief in God has virtually gone. Now that was 1959. And I think that he's spot on. What he's talking about is secularism. And we live in a secular culture. A culture in which the very basic framework of Christianity is disappearing. And it's a very, it's a very different place than where we were 50 years ago. And it makes being witnesses very challenging. I mean, where do we even start? One of the most popular evangelistic techniques over the last 15 years starts like this. Let me give you an example of the challenge. It starts like this. Uh, if God were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? Okay. Well, apart from I've always thought it's odd that it says my heaven as if there's another heaven, but I don't know if you ever thought about that. But, uh, but apart from that, uh, you know, if you ask that question today, someone would say, which God? I don't believe in God. Oh, you mean the energy that's all around us? And what are you talking about, heaven? I'm already there. I just have to escape reality. Or I don't believe. I just believe that we're you know, matter and time. So, so, so that question, it starts by assuming with people that they have a Christian frame of reference, that they understand God, that they understand that he is just and a judge, that there is a heaven and that there is a hell, that the eternity of the soul, these kinds of things were assumed before, but they can't no longer be assumed. We're in an altogether different place. And so where do we even start how do we be witnesses today? Enter the book of Acts. The book of Acts has unparalleled resources for bringing the gospel and, bringing, and being witnesses in a culture that does not know or does not have a framework for the gospel. Because the book of Acts is all about the expansion of the gospel out into places that did not know the gospel or did not have a Christian world view, didn't have a Christian framework, intellectually or otherwise. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to look at the book of Acts, and particularly I want to look at Acts chapter 18 and see if we might not can glean some, some wisdom, some resources for what it means and how to be witnesses in the secular age. Because that's who we are. You are my witnesses. We are missionaries to a secular age. Well, we start at the beginning of the chapter and note verse 1. It says that after this, Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth. That is that we pick up this in the middle of a journey. Paul is traveling all around the eastern Mediterranean basin from city to city in the first century. Why? Well, it's very clear. He's going, verse 5 to testify about Jesus. Verse 5, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to Jews that the Christ was Jesus. Paul is going to tell people the good news. 
the good news of what the God of Israel has done in Jesus Christ for the world. Now, evangelism, that's what Christians call it, or proselytizing, that's what sociologists call it. Well, our modern world, it just calls it arrogant, wrong, because, I mean, it's just, it's just imperialistic to impose your view of reality on somebody else. That's how it goes. Uh, this, was, this was put very clearly um, by uh, Oprah. On one of her shows, she's talking to a prominent Christian, and he said, I believe that Christianity is the truth. And Oprah responded, well, I respect that as long as you don't say that your faith is more true than my faith. In other words, what Oprah was saying is what many people believe, and that is this, that, that all religions and all religious perspectives of the truth are equally valid and right. And therefore, if they're equally valid and right, what gives you the right to tell me or try to impose your view of religious reality onto me? See? It's, it's arrogant to think that you have the truth and I don't. That's the, that's the way that it goes. Uh, now, this seems very humble, and it seems right to us, because we live in a secular age. But I'm going to suggest to you that if you just stop and think about it for a second, just a second, just pause, that it actually doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is, is this. I mean, think about it. If you say that all religious perspectives on the truth are equally valid, well, isn't that a religious perspective on the truth? And if you tell me that I should live according to that, isn't that a form of proselytization? Evangelism? You see, we're all evangelizing. We're all proselytizing. Every single one of us, let's be honest about that, every single one of us is doing that. We all believe that there is a that there is a truth about religious reality or reality in general. And we're all seeking to live according to that truth and all think that other people should live according to that truth. So, for instance, if, if you think that, that there's a unique perspective on truth and that perspective on truth is for everyone, then you will try to get everyone to believe it. However, if you think that all perspectives on truth and all perspectives on religion reality are equally valid, then that itself is a perspective on religious reality, and you are going to try to get other people to believe it and live according to it. So, so we, all have a, we all have a perspective on truth, and we all evangelize, and the claim that all religious perspectives on truth are equally valid, well, you have to understand that that is a claim that Christians actually deny. See, the Christian claim is that the one creator, sustainer, redeemer, and judge of the world, that he has revealed himself uniquely in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The Christian claim is that there is salvation in no one else, Acts 4.12. For there is no under name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And if that's the truth, then that truth is for everyone. And we have to tell everyone. We have to witness to everyone because God has revealed himself uniquely in the person of Jesus Christ. So let's not make, I don't want you to be mistaken here this morning. If you are here and many of you are and you're not a Christian, I want you to be very, I want you to know straight up what I'm doing. I want you to adopt Christianity. I want you to adopt the Christian claims about Jesus. I want you to know that because I believe that there is a God, one God, and that he is real. And I believe that he is steadfast love and mercy. And I believe that he is just and he is bringing justice and righteousness to the earth. And I believe that there is an ocean of love waiting for you. And I believe there's a coming judgment. And so I want you to believe in Jesus Christ. 
And I'm going to try to convince you of that. That's what we're doing. And if you don't believe that's true, I understand. And you're going to try to convince me otherwise. And I don't fault you for that if you think that's the best thing for the world. But let's just be honest about what we're doing here. Christians, we are his witnesses because this is what we believe. Christians call it evangelism. Sociologists call it proselytizing. The modern world calls it arrogant and imperialistic. But the Bible, the Bible, it calls it necessary. So here's the question. How do we bring the gospel into a non-Christian context? How did Paul bring the gospel to this non-Christian context in Corinth? Just to give you an idea of what Corinth was, uh, Corinth was a trade city. It was an entertainment capital. It was a place that people moved into, uh, and they were there for a short amount of time on a business trip and then left. And what happened in Corinth stayed in Corinth. Sound familiar? It was also the entertainment capital of the ancient world. That is, that that's where uh, the stars were. If you wanted, you could go see how close your hand uh, print was to say, I don't know, um, the ancient Roman actor George Clooney. Sound familiar? That's Corinth. Corinth is a mix between L.A. and Vegas. And this is where Paul goes to take the gospel. And what does he do when he gets there? Well, the first thing that he does is he he develops strategic partners. Notice that the first thing that Paul does in verse 2 is he networks to find these two Jews who have recently moved to the city, Aquila and Priscilla. And it says that when he meets them, he doesn't just make contact with them, but verse 3 says that he lives and works with them. That he stays with them, that he develops a relationship with them. Why? One of the people who have helped us to see the Western world as a missions context more than anyone else is Leslie Newbigin. Leslie Newbigin worked in India for quite a while. He returned to uh, his home in England, and as he was in England, he noticed that the culture there, that people believe the gospel in, in, in England just about as much as they did in India. And he realized that, wait a second, like we have to, the, the church has to assume a posture of missions in Britain. And as he began to think about this and strategize about this, uh, New began, he brought to crystal clarity um, how unique and important the community is. The community is for providing context for the gospel or for evangelism in a non-Christian or post-Christian context. Uh, New began said, quote, in a very influential essay, Newman can say there's no hermeneutic for gospel, but, uh, for the gospel, but for the believing community. And what he meant by this is this: a hermeneutic is a lens by which you can see something. It's kind of like um, it's kind of like glasses. Right? You can't see without glasses, and glasses put things in perspective. It gives things a context. And Newman said that that the when people don't have a framework for the gospel, when they don't understand it, the believing community gives them that framework because it's in the believing community that 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 people experience the love of God and then share that love of God with one another. It's there where a biblical ethic is displayed, and it's there where they show forth the hope that we have in Christ through their lives and work. And it's in the midst of the believing community, by the way, where the Spirit is most potently present and manifest, particularly in their praise in the midst of suffering. And so he said... What has to happen for people to understand the gospel really is they, they have to see it lived out in the believing community and that gives them the context to hear it, to understand the words. Why is Paul connecting with Aquila and Priscilla and why does he stay and live with them? Because he knows that in a non-Christian context you need community to explain the gospel to people. This is why I think that Jesus chose 12. It's why I think that Acts records how the early church grew and and people were added to their numbers when they came together and shared their possessions with one another and gathered around the word. It's why I think missions in the books of Acts is primarily done by sending out people in twos, not solo. And it's why I think Paul, why he greets Priscilla 
and Aquila and makes relationship with them. So here's my question to you, or here's one thing that you need to think about. Uh, What am I saying? Am I saying that you can't do or evangelism can't be done or you can't present the gospel with an individual relationship with someone on, on on your own? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's a lot harder. It's going to be a lot harder for them to understand. And so what you need to think about is this. Here's, here's something that I would like for you to think about. Who do you know? Think about your non-Christian friends. How can you connect? What non-Christian friends do you have that you can connect with two of your Christian friends? Now, some of you, are realize that is a very daunting question because, like me, you work in a Christian institution. And your kids maybe go to school at a Christian institution, and you're like, I don't, I don't even have non-Christian friends. It's hard. But you must. The need is too great for us not to have non-Christian friends in the second most never church city in the country. You are his witnesses. So make sacrifices, figure it out, get a hobby, and make sure that you connect with people who don't know the gospel. That's why you're here. Why do you think God has you here? Why hasn't he taken you? And that's one of the reasons. So, who can you connect with? Paul connects with Aquila and Priscilla first, and he lives with them, and he works with them, notice. That's one of the first things that Paul does, is he starts working with them. And I don't think that that's incidental that the text tells us that, because you know what? One of the best ways to promote the gospel in the world is doing your work to the glory of God. It's one of the best ways to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, how is that? I mean, do a Bible study work? No. That's fine. That's good. A prayer meeting at your work? Well, that's fine and good too, but no. Just do your work to the glory of God. Because think about it. If apart from your family, your greatest responsibility in life where God has called you to be most of the day, most of the week is your work. And you are his witnesses. So it's there in work that he wants you to witness. To witness by doing work to his glory. One pastor tells a story about a gal who came into his church. She was not a Christian, but she's investigating Christianity. He said, how did you end up here? And she said, well, I work in a profession that is very, very, very competitive. And in my profession, your job is everything. And mistakes are not really accepted. And one day I blew it. I completely blew it. And people started to realize that, that somebody had blown it. And we're in the middle of this meeting. And I realized at that moment, I, I, started, I started sweating, and I'm thinking, like, they're going to figure out it's me, and when I confess, I'm done for. And the gal said, and in that moment, one of my superiors, he took the fall for me. And she goes, I went and, and I asked him, I said, why did you take the fall for me? And she said, and he said, don't worry about it. No, I want to know, why did you take the fall for me? Well, if you insist, I'm a Christian. And, well, Jesus took the fall for me so that I could live and flourish. How could I not t- take the fall for others? And she said, This guy found something that was worth more than his career. And it was Jesus, and I'm here to, I'm here to understand why. Sometimes it's doing your work to the glory of God that God uses to promote the gospel in the world. Paul, he connects with Aquila and Priscilla, but they're not the only ones. Verse 5 says that when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to Jews that the Christ was Jesus. Now, 
This is probably a mistranslation in verse 5. Uh, it, it, it's probably not that Paul, the case that Paul was occupied with the word. It's probably the case that, that it's because Silas and Timothy arrived that Paul was able now to be occupied with the word. Uh, that is that Timothy and Silas came and they provided the emotional and material resources that enabled Paul to devote himself to preaching and teaching and proclaiming Jesus. See, in other words, Silas and Timothy, they're his partners in ministry that support him. And we do that in all kinds of ways. When you give to our RUF campus ministers like Jonathan Keenan or Alex Watlington or Matt Trexel, you are giving so that they can be on the campus as faithful witnesses to devote themselves to explaining and reasoning with people about the word of Jesus Christ. When you give to our global partners like Buck Butler or Rachel, Beverage, or the readers, you are giving so that they can actually be in those places as faithful witnesses to, to proclaim the word. You get to be a part of the ministry of the gospel. And that's a way in which you are a part. You are his witnesses, and then you are also partners with witnesses across the globe and in our own hometown. Now, Paul partners with Silas and Timothy, but he also then partners with this guy named Titius Justus. If you're, if you're looking, you know, you're expecting, you're really having a hard time with a name for a kid, that might be one. It goes either gender Trust me, it'll be weird enough. Nobody will care. So Titius Justice, and Paul meets with, with him uh, and stays in his house and ministers in his house, which really brings us to the next thing that Paul does, and that is that Paul uses flexible methods. I want you to see that. And verse 4 tells us that Paul did, when he got to the city, he did that which was his custom. That is, he, he went into the synagogue every Sabbath, and he tried to persuade Jews and Greeks that he reasoned with them. Now, why does Paul go to the synagogue? Paul goes to the synagogue because he's a Jew. And as a Jew, he could go to the synagogue and he had an inn. That's where he had an inn. If Paul wasn't a Jew, he wouldn't have gone to the synagogue, trust me. He goes to the synagogue, though, because that's where he knows he can network. That's where he knows he'll be led in. That's where he knows that he can develop friends and connection. And that's where he knows that he can actually have an outlet to talk to them about the gospel. He, he finds a strategic place. Now, for most of us in here, the synagogue is not going to be that place for us. But you do have a place. Where do you have an inn with non-Christians? Maybe it's PTA. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's your cycling club. Maybe it's, maybe it's the surfers that you surf with. Maybe it's your fraternity brothers or sisters or sorority. Maybe... It is the people at your, your co-workers. But where do you have an inn? Maybe it's the coffee shop. Maybe it's the brewery. I know at least one of you that has an inn there. Where do you have an inn? Paul goes and he persuades Jews and Greeks there in the synagogue every day. And notice what he does. He Notice the language that, that verse 4 uses. It says that he reasons with them. He persuades them. And it's Jews and Greeks who are there. See, he's not focused just on Jews. He's talking to Jews and Greeks. It's just that, that is, that's his end. And so he, he reasons with them. He persuades them. Uh, in other words, uh, Paul goes in and, and he talks to them. And he starts with where they are the Jews and Greeks. He starts with where they are and not where he wants them to be, and that's what we have to do. You know, if you are going to persuade someone, then you have to actually know something about where they are, what their objections are, what they think. You have to know what their deepest hopes are, what their fears are, why they don't like this, what causes them not to be able to listen. What are their hang-ups with Christianity? Do you know that about your non-Christian friends? You have to listen and then respond. 
Paul listens. He, he starts with where they are, not where he wants them to be. He, he answers objections they have and not the ones that he thinks they have. And he connects with them where they are. Notice that it says that, that when he persuades them, it says in verse 5 that he was testifying to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. He testifies to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. Now that is a very Jewish way of putting the gospel. That the Christ, great David's greater son, the Jewish Messiah, who was to be the ruler of the world, that, that, that Jesus was the Christ. You know, Paul doesn't always present the gospel that way. If we compare this to Acts 17, where he is in Athens and he meets with philosophers, very, very different message. Very, very different message. When he's there, uh, Paul, he hardly mentions Jesus. He spends most of his time talking about the sovereignty of God and a God-centered view of history, how there's one creator of all things, a Christian framework for time. When he's there, he doesn't use the scriptures at all, but he quotes their poets. Because they don't know the scriptures. And when he's there talking to them, he mentions Jesus, but not even by name. But he does say that God, this one God who is over all history, is uniquely acting in a man who he raised from the dead. Now that is very different. That is very different. That is a very different way of putting the gospel than trying to persuade people that, the, that Jesus was the Messiah. Very different, because it's a very different audience. See, he adapts his message. And I'm not talking about corrupting. I'm talking about crafting. You see, the gospel plays in 10,000 places. And there are so many ways in which you can explain it. Paul does this throughout his letters as well, by the way, even to Christian congregations. You know, um, you know, Paul is really known for this dichotomy between justification by faith versus works of the law. Do you know how many books that shows up in? Three. Galatians, Romans, and one verse in Philippians. That's it. Is it central to his theology and message? Yes. But does he frame it like that when he talks to the Corinthians? No. Because he's not talking to a Jewish audience there. No, there he talks about Christ as the wisdom and the power of God and how that wisdom and power is known in weakness and foolishness. He doesn't use that language, how God chose the weak things of this world to shame the wise. He doesn't use that language in Romans or Galatians. Different audiences. You see, we have to actually, we have to see that the multifaceted dimensions of the gospel can be communicated in a variety of ways that connect with people where they're at. I mean, Jesus is the one who was rich, who became poor for our sake, so that through his poverty we might become rich. The gospel is about the judge who comes off the throne to suffer punishment in our place so that we might go free. The gospel is that Jesus came to defeat the powers of sin and death so that we could be released from the addictions and slavery that we are caught in. The gospel is... The gospel is that we who were abandoned and orphaned, have been brought in to a family. There are a variety of ways to express the good news of the truth of what God has done and is doing in Jesus Christ by the Spirit. Craft the message to persuade the audience. Don't corrupt it. If you lose the message, then there's no point. But craft it. Paul crafts it. And notice that, that, that you don't have to say everything at once. Paul does not get to everything in that, uh, in that 
in that sermon, which I hope you'll go study later in Acts 17, he doesn't get to everything, but at the end it says this. When he mentions the resurrection, some of them said, we're done with you. But others came up to him and they said, we would like to hear more. We would like to hear more. You know what that means? It means that that Paul didn't think that he had to do everything all at once, that, that, that actually he understood that people would move through stages. And most often in a non-Christian context and culture, that's how conversion is going to happen, through stages. It's going to be a process. First, the gospel becomes understandable. Then it becomes somewhat credible or plausible. And then people come to conviction and believe. And that means sometimes it's going to take time. Paul was not in Corinth for a day. The text says he was there for over a year. Paul adapts his message. He also, therefore, has to adapt in that time his methods. Look in verse 6. He is presenting the gospel to Jews and Greeks there in the synagogue. And then it says that they oppose him and revile him. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own hands. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left and he went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Now what's going on here? This sounds kind of harsh. I mean, is Paul... Is Paul done with the Jews? Is that what he's saying? Well, I don't think so, because the very next verse says that a ruler of the synagogue was converted. He's not done with the Jews. He just realizes that this is an inhospitable place, an ineffective place, for him to present the gospel, and so he moves next door. Does that mean that it's going to be a little bit harder for Jews to go into a Gentile's house because of kosher laws? Yes. Does that mean that there's a slight different focus on target audience? Yes. But Paul, he is still seeking to win, as he was in the synagogue, Jews and Greeks. But he changes his methods. He is relocated. And in doing so, verse 8, many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And we have to, we have to, we have to adapt our methods as well. We have to always be adapting our method. The gospel has to stay central. The goals have to be the same. We want to see God glorified. We want to see the church grown up. We want to see those gathered in who do not know Jesus. We want those things. But the way that we go about that, that can change radically. We can't have sacred cow ministries that because we did something the way that we always done it. uh, if, If it doesn't work in our context, we don't do it. We switch. A great example of this. I didn't ask him if I could say this, but uh, but I was I was at Presbytery yesterday, and an RUF campus minister who will rename a uh, name unnamed talked about how they were trying to uh, have conversations with students at a campus that will remain unnamed, and is very close by. And at that campus, uh, decided, hey, we'll get loads of donuts, and we'll say, hey, here's a free donut. And uh, as students were going by, they looked at donuts and they saw like evil trans fats, you know, yummy, evil trans fats. And so then they kept going, right? Especially, you know, if they were by themselves and no one was around, it was between class, they might sneak over and get a donut. But when they're with a group, no, right? And so, it, you know, it wasn't like the place this person was before where people see donuts or gravy and biscuits or barbecue and they think heaven, right? A different place. Um, unnamed person. So they were like, okay, we'll get grapes. And I got grapes. And I started handing grapes out and people come over and get grapes, you know, I'll take grapes. You know, even better would be like, you know, kale, chips, seaweed, and uh, what, acai little berries, right? You know, that's when you get power foods, right? Power fruits, those things will, uh, and, and for the paleo, it's just lots of bacon. Um, but change your methods, right? You change your methods based on, on who you're reaching. And Paul does that. He adapts. 
He changes methods and he reads people, but, but it's not without heartache. And that's the other thing that I want you to notice about what, what does it mean? How do we reach people in a, in, a, in a secular culture? How do we reach people in a non-Christian culture? Well, I wanted you to notice this, and this is probably the most important thing. In order to reach people in a secular culture, in a non-Christian culture, Paul failed. He was reviled. He was oppressed. He had to switch locations. He was rejected by his own people, whom he had spent time day in and day out with, and he failed. Now, I know what you might be think, I know that you might think you hear what I'm saying. And you think that I'm saying, you got to try new stuff because you never know. And so you got to like, you got to keep failing to get it right. And some of that's true. You got you to try and fail and you got to figure out like, we'll do community groups this way. Well, that didn't work. We'll try them this way. Sometimes you you got to fail to get it right. But that's not the main point that I'm talking about. Now, what I'm talking about is something different. What I'm talking about is, um, well, I'll illustrate it with a, a story from that preacher I talked about earlier, Martin Lloyd Jones. He was in a group of ministers once when he was younger, and they, the ministers were older, and they were commenting about how a younger man was very, very gifted. And they said, well, the Lord is going to use him. The Lord is going to use him. And then one of them said, yeah, but I don't think he's been humbled yet. And then a grave look came upon all their faces and it hit them very hard. And it hit Lloyd-Jones hard because he knew that the only way to be used by God is to be wounded by him. That the only way to succeed is to fail. That actually it's not until you come to that point of dependence where you actually gain success. Paul doesn't have one convert, the text tells us, that we know about until he gets kicked out, reviled, and oppressed, until he fails. And then people believe and are baptized. And I don't think that that, I don't think that that is a coincidence. I don't think it could be any other way for one who is witnessing to the crucified one whose power was made perfect in weakness. The infinite God who became finite for us. The insufferable God who suffered for us. The God whose light shines brightest in the darkness of noonday. The king who reigns from a tree the one who is exalted in his humiliation, I don't think it works anywhere, any way else. You see, there's something about, about the power of God coming in the weakness of humans and even in his own weakness that goes back to his very nature, his very self. And so it can't be any other way. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that uh, there's a hardship, there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of suffering that that I've had to go through for a minister. And 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 as I was thinking about this week, and and I think I've been made the better for it. But I was thinking about this week, and I was like, you know, I want to get up here and say. I wouldn't take any of it back. I would take it all back. I wouldn't go through it. But then I wouldn't be serving Jesus. There is no other way. There is no other way. It's in pain that we experience power. It's in darkness that we see the light. That's how the gospel works. That's how God works in the world. And he works through the failure of the church. That's where he sees, that's where he brings victory. 
Sinclair Ferguson put it like this, God intends to bring life out of death. We may well think of this as the principle behind all evangelism. It is out of Christ's weakness that the sufficiency of his saving power will be born. So, fruitful evangelism is the result of this death-producing principle. It is when we come to share spiritually and on occasions physically with Christ's death that his power is demonstrated in our weakness and others are drawn to him. There is no other way. And some of you, you've been doing this Christian life thing, you've been trying to serve God, and it just hurts and it doesn't seem to be working. It's working. That's how it works. Because, you see, salvation, it's always grace. It's always God bringing life out of death. And it's always his miraculous power. You see, grace doesn't build bridges. It leaps gaps. And there are no through trains from death to resurrection. There is no logical, rational step that goes from death to resurrection. You see, it only comes by the miraculous power of God who speaks things into existence that do not exist. And every successful ministry goes the same way. Every successful ministry is not rational or logical. It is an act of resurrection by the God who brings life out of death. It's then that Paul gets this vision, verse 9. And the Lord said to Paul alone at night, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking. Do not be silent. I am with you. No one will attack you or harm you, for I have many in the city who are my people. Paul, it hurts, but I'm with you. People attack you, but I am with you. No one will harm you. It will go forward. In one of Newbegin's most famous essays, he writes, If our evangelism is at bottom an effort to shore up a tottering edifice of the church, then it will not be heard as good news. The church is in God's keeping. We do not have the right to be anxious about it. We have the Lord's word that the gates of hell should not prevail against it. The crux of the matter is that we have been chosen to be bearers of the good news for the world. And the question is simply whether we will be faithful in communicating it. What Newbegin's saying is that if we present the gospel in fear that if we don't evangelize, we'll lose the church, we'll never present the gospel. Because we're actually not presenting the good news of God's victory in the midst of death and weakness. We're not trusting in him. I am with you, Paul. And he goes on, for I have many in this city who are my people. God is assuring Paul that there are many in Corinth who are potentially and by predestination the Lord's people. And that is good news because that means that Paul cannot fail even in his failure. And that's good news for you and me as well because that means that we cannot fail even in our failure because God, he is saving people from every tongue and tribe and nation and he has many people all over the globe and still out there or else Jesus would have come back. And so we go and we tell knowing that there are many that he has. Do you realize that God wants to save people more than you do? And God wants to save people more than I do? That his heart and his compassion are for them way greater than ours are. And so we can go because he actually wants to save. And he's the only one who can do it. Newbegin concludes, Although it may seem simplistic, I most deeply believe it it is fundamental to recognize that what brings men and women and children to know Jesus as Lord and Savior is always the mysterious work of the Holy Spirit always beyond our understanding or control, always the result of a presence, a reality that both draws and challenges the reality who is in fact a living God himself. I am with you, and I have many people in this city. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He is with you. You are his witnesses. Amen.